Good morning. Welcome to the Image Source Animation webinar, Dead Archiving for the Public Sector. I'm Julie, and I'll be moderating today's event. So I'll be in the background addressing any technical concerns about your connection. I'll also be monitoring questions throughout the presentation that our presenters will address. You may ask an online question anytime throughout the presentation by simply clicking on the question mark icon located on the floating toolbar on the bottom right side of your screen or in the Q&A or chat panels. You should again see those on the right side of your screen. I will now turn the presentation over to Christina Parma with Image Source, who will introduce our panelists and begin our discussion. Christina? Well, thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone, to our webinar. We're very excited to have you all here today. Um, for those of you who don't you know, know very much about Image Source, um, we're an ECM, Enterprise Content Management Provider. We've been in the business for 17 plus years. And we've worked with um, government entities ranging from municipalities, county, state, city. Um, so we've worked with many um, government accounts over, over, our, over the course of our, uh, of our company's history. Um, and we offer a comprehensive um, package of services, everything from consulting and analysis to training, um, maintenance and support. Um, and we've been really watching the evolution of this technology for about the last five years, and we've been really impressed by the performance and results that it's been giving our government customers. And so really the purpose of this webinar today is to provide you with some information that can give you another strategy or a choice as to what you may already have in place. So with that being said, Jay Cropper is a senior storage engineer with iMation. He's held various positions with major storage vendors ranging from enterprise architecture to consulting and has focused on regulatory compliance and archival for the past 15 years. Um, drawing on his experience, he brings a unique perspective with the ability to provide expertise for both the business as well as the technical needs of an organization. So with that being said, I'd like to hand it over to Jay. Oh, thanks so much, Christina. Good morning, everyone. Uh, wanted to uh, briefly introduce iMation. Um, we've been in business for 50 plus years in the storage industry, and as it says on the on the slide, inventors of magnetic tape. In fact, we supply uh, over a third of the world's LPO uh, tape. Um, global reach to over 100 countries. We've been iMation for about almost 17 years now, spun off from 3M in in '96. I want to talk to you today about is the explosion of data in the digital universe. And as you can see on your screen, back in 2009, we were about worldwide 80% of one zettabyte. And a zettabyte has 21 zeros after it, just for a frame of reference. Uh, the projection is things will grow by a factor of 44 to get to 35 zettabytes by the year 2020. That's comprised of a lot of images that we're all familiar with. It used to be that you would take one photo and then maybe another one to be safe to make sure the photo came out. With digital photography, now you take multiple photos with the hope that you'll delete the ones that you don't need when in reality we end up holding on to all of them. So bank images, exploding email, um, static data. And that's what I wanted to talk to you a lot about today was static data and how it's housed in our primary storage, but there never was the consideration in the, in the initial creation of primary storage to have to deal with such a glut of information. New set of storage problems, as you can see, are emerging. Um, and, and a lot of these are faced by every single industry, uh, none the least uh, government, state, and local. How do I guarantee the data is retained? How do I store data in the most cost-effective way? We'll talk a lot about that today. And how do I balance, make sure the data is delivered to the right person at the right time with the most cost effectivity, but most importantly, how do I make sure that I can back this data up and that my data is secure specifically when it comes to a compliance situation where I have to produce that data maybe in a short amount of time uh, to be compliant with regulations that uh, I'm held under or have to uphold. So I'd like to discuss a little bit about 
backup versus archive. Two very different paradigms that seem very similar. A lot of the clients that I talk to, a lot of the uh, people that I run into will say, we've got archive coverage. We, we do backups. And that, that becomes our archive. When in reality, um, what backup does is copies the same data over and over and over again, which is very necessary for a DR situation, short term in nature. But if your business goes down, if, if there's a disaster that happens, you want to be able to get back to that latest point in time to bring the business back online and continue on with, with, your, with the nature of the business. Con contrasting is archive, which actually moves data from the primary storage. Protecting it to long term, and most importantly, it now makes it easily searchable. With backup data in a lot of cases, you're not able to retrieve individual files, depending on what your backup mechanism is. You have to restore that whole backup set and then be able to search through it to find what you're looking for. Whereas archives should present itself so that it's easily searched for the content that you're looking for, hopefully indexed. And I'll show you a mechanism that we use to provide that. Um, the issue is, is, is becoming very quickly that this flood of information is filling our SANS and NAS devices, whatever used for primary, secondary storage, with static content. We're powering, we're cooling that static content and backing it up continuously, when in reality, what we should be doing is putting that on the appropriate tier. So what are the drivers behind archive? As I just said, backup costs, um, the time involved to do these backups, as our data sets become larger and larger, the amount of time it takes to back that data up increases. We used to call it the race to sunrise. Um, how, how much data can you get backed up before work has to resume again the next day? And the cost of disks, that's driving a lot of the need to archive it and find a different way to stop the insanity. We keep loading the SANs and NASs, primary and secondary storage, and increasing the amount of footprint. More power, more cooling is necessary. And then at the end of all of this, how do we comply with regulatory compliances and keep our data for the set amount of time that it should be kept for, but then at the end of that retention period, delete it if that's part of the regulation. So we'll show you a couple of ways we can, we can approach that. The Infinivault is a family of appliances from Imation that help to address this by providing a platform to allow you to move that data, that static content, and it's uh, infrequently accessed static content that's sitting on your SAN at a much higher cost to a platform that provides you the regulatory compliance, fast search capability, and cost effectivity that you're looking for. Purpose built to provide the e-discovery capability. And I'll show you a couple of examples of clients that we have who have put this into place and are solving some of these needs. Disaster tolerance, because it provides the ability now to make multiple copies upstream versus making a copy or moving the data, if you will, and then making a copy once it's moved. We can actually make copies as we're moving the data through these archive tiers. But one of the biggest points that I wanted to mention is the optimization. By moving that data out of your primary storage, you're actually increasing the efficiency of the primary storage. Less data means quicker searches and the ability to move through the data that's in your primary storage at a much faster rate. In addition, you could prolong a storage purchase and you're not gonna be spending the money to power and cool data which is infrequently accessed. So there's a lot of uh, points that I want to make with the optimization and efficiency. We talked about how it complements SAN and NAS by removing that static, static content from your primary or secondary storage. The effect is it has a dramatic effect on your backup. It's going to reduce your backup set and allow you to shorten 
that backup window, not to mention the components required to provide that backup in your environment. Software, administration, hardware, it's all involved to provide you that backup platform. Because you're organizing things, you're simplifying your compliance and retention management. By segregating that data, you now have a better handle on how do I set up my specific policies for a specific data set to be able to maintain that regulatory compliance. And the, the end result of that is you automate and ensure that the disaster recovery of that data is in place. So I'll show you how the system will actually manage multiple tiers in the archive tier, the archive platform, to allow you to automate the uh, movement of that data from your SAN through the archive tier. And, and all of this is going to come in what we're seeing on the data that we have from our clients is at about one-third of the cost. At what, what, what it costs to store it on your primary storage. Protecting that as well with removable media, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. They're actually removable disk drives on RDX to provide you the capability for long-term archival on that media while being protected. So to talk a little bit about one of our clients, Marin County. Up in Marin County, the challenge they were facing was they had a variety of requirements and retention periods. One of those was forever, right? So they needed to hang on to some of the data forever. A lot of their documents were stored on different platforms offline. And the end result was they had an unreliable platform or conglomeration of platforms um, that was hard to search, hard to get a hold of data. In fact, they had no more storage space, so they, they were unable to implement email archiving, which was another regulatory compliance that they had to adhere to. So what we were able to do with them was we introduced an incentive alt model 35 that allowed them to retain their data in a compliant fashion, but also the ability to search all of their data. So now they had it in one central location, organized through a disk to disk backup mechanism, and then provided them with offsite storage as well. That, as you can see in the results, allowed them to achieve the ability to reduce their costs, both in maintenance and servers for their backup tier. They met California's requirements for what they had to do for retention were able to access everything, but also able to now implement email archiving. Because they organized the data in the correct locations, they became very efficient with how they were managing that data. And that provided them a pathway to enable email archiving. You can see in the, the quote from Carla over to the right, she says that allowed us to reduce our maintenance costs and server requirements associated with proprietary media management. She's talking about the backup here. But basically, because we were able to shrink that backup data set, she was able to use less servers and less licenses on those servers now. So it has sort of a ripple effect. We're optimizing primary storage. We're helping them become more efficient. They gain more storage, and now they can become more compliant in their environment. This is how they broke it up. Within the incentive vault is the concept of vaults and folders, and the vault determines whether it's going to be worm and what kind of compliant regulations we're, we're tuned to uh, adhere to. What Marin did was they broke their data up into four separate vaults. As you can see, there was a read-write vault for home shares. These are uh, home shares for files that were infrequently accessed. Static data, again, they can move it off into this, into this tier and save money and prolong the purchase of additional storage for the primary stand. In another vault, they had high-def video. That was actually dash cam video for the police cruisers that they could pull over there. Now, and, the, and 
and allowing them to have the quick access and retrieval for litigation purposes. If that case came up to court, they could find that clip very quickly and be able to produce that. Council email, that was part of the email archive that we spoke about earlier. And then the um, DA's office, so um, cases and uh, documents associated with those cases. But what they ended up with is a common management structure across all of it. The InfiniVault system, after the files are ingested into the online area, we'll take it from there. We'll go into a little bit more of the architecture. But that gave them the ability now to be able to retrain, uh, ret retain that data for long periods of time. Some of that had a set retention period, at which point the system will delete the files at the end of that period. But that is all settable and user configurable and will help you through setting that all up. So if we take a little bit of a look at the architecture, on the, on the top of your screen, you see the Vault Center OS. Its responsibility is help with the management of getting that data from tier to tier. And as you can see, there's four tiers here that we're mentioning uh, within the archive platform. So the Vault Center OS sits on top of these storage controllers that manage the hard disk drive area, that's a RAID area, and then the removal of disk drive area, noted as RDX here, with the ability, if, if you desire, to remote replicate to another InfiniVault. So within that online tier, the data is held for a period, moved to the near line tier, which is actually those removable drives that I talked about on cartridges, and I'll show you a slide on that. And then you can remove those cartridges to provide an offline tier and then subsequently bring them off site for further DR capability. A little look at that software, which is the heart of the of each Infiniball provides the compliance capability, that space efficiency by moving things off of the online disk area down to removable disk, provides the reliability and the glue, if you will, between that multi-tiered storage pool. Now, even if the cartridge is removed from the system, the Vault Center OS still keeps track of all of the files. So at any point in time, you know exactly where your file or which cartridge it's sitting on, and the system will actually notify you. So if you request a file, and that file doesn't have to happen to be on a cartridge that's inserted in one of the slots, it'll actually notify you and say, that file is located on cartridge XYZ. You can barcode these as well, but basically it gives you a, a pointer to where that that file is located. You simply insert the cartridge and then you can retrieve the file. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So this management software, as I mentioned, is providing, as you can see, these bullet points, the accessibility by managing the policy from cradle to grave that, that files uh, immutability that, that its preservation is maintained, as well as its chain of custody. If we're replicating or providing encryption, that's all done through the software as well to efficiently manage that data, including deduplication through single instancing, as you can see on that data efficiency. I wanted to break out the compliance piece for you to further illustrate that particular section in detail. The compliance piece allows you to create a vault that's write once, read many, a worm vault. And that provides the immutability, as you can see on that first bullet point. Immutability is a guarantee that that, that file has been the same since it was ingested until its disposition, whatever that is. Uh, whether it's seven years, 10 years, Whatever the regulation dictates, the file has been in the same state that it was from the time it was put on the system. The data deletion, as you can see on the left, is basically that retention period. So at the end of the retention period, in order to comply with some of the regulations, the data needs to be deleted at that point in time. 
So there's fines for not having it, there's fines for having it at, at times. Legal hold gives us the ability as we're nearing the end of a retention period where the system would normally delete the, that data, those files. Legal hold gives us the ability to say, hang on, don't delete those files yet. Maybe there's a case pending for litigation on a particular aspect of what this data is involved with. So we're going to make sure that the system, we kind of override that automatic deletion. We provide that capability on a file-by-file -file basis. And then the e-discovery capability. If we want to go through and quickly identify all the documents associated with a particular scenario, e-discovery gives the ability through content, content indexing to go in and be able to see uh, all of the files that were related to that particular scenario. As I mentioned, there's an audit trail with a chain of custody reporting that shows in a compliant manner, everything that has been done with that file since its ingestion until its deletion from the system. So with a removable cartridge, you're able to produce the file in its original format with a report that, that shows the life of that file as it lived on the system. As I said, you can index the file and make it able to be content searched for quick retrieval and then that legal hold ability to stop the deletion. In addition, there are other features that are implemented within the system that you can use or not use, depending on what your compliance needs are. For instance, there's the AES 256-bit algorithm, which is encryption you can apply to the vault or to the folder. We'll go into that a little bit more. But basically, a applies the ability to now imply, apply encryption on top of these files in addition to what's already on the system. The last bullet talks about automated key management. If you were to take one of these removable cartridges from the Incentival and try to read it anywhere else, you couldn't do it. That's because the keys are maintained on each Incentival. And where the files were ingested is the only place that they can be read from that initial Incentival. We have the ability to back up the InfiniVault. In fact, that's an automated scheduled thing. The InfiniVault is backed up either to a removable cartridge or to a network location so that if the InfiniVault becomes impaired somehow, something happens, a disaster happens to the InfiniVault, you use that backup on another InfiniVault to recover the system, and then you can read the cartridges where files were ingested. So that's how we protect on the InfiniVault as well. A little bit more digging, peeling the onion back a little bit on the architecture. Files are ingested via the network. We recommend at least a gig E network infrastructure. We can support 10 gig E as well into the system controller. And that, that network attachment is via NAS. It's either a drive letter on a Windows box uh, system, or it could be a mount point on Unix or Linux via NFS or SIS. The files are ingested via the network and then into an online disk area, as you can see RAID there. We call that an ODU, an online disk unit. After a certain threshold is met, we'll take those files and then move them down to the removable disk unit where they're deposited onto those RDX disk cartridges. So we call it an infinite off offline capacity because as you fill an RDX cartridge, and those are available now in sizes up to a, a terabyte and a half, you can remove that cartridge, replace it with a blank cartridge and keep on going. So we can span multiple cartridges. And as you can see, it's all browser-based configuration and management allows you to attach to this from anywhere that you have browser access. So a quick view of the family. On the bottom, you see the InfiniVault 5, which is the sort of the entry level system. There's 1.8 terabytes of RAID area. That's that online area. 
your mount points, if you will, where your share is attached to. From there you have, in this example, they're showing five terabytes of RDX. This is with one terabyte cartridges inserted in the slots, and there's five of those slots. And unlimited offline, because as you fill those cartridges, you can just replace them with blank cartridges. Next up in the family is the Infinivault 35. That gives you the ability to grow that removable media area up to 100 slots. And then the Infinivault 70 allows you to grow not only the removable media area, but also that online disk area. And we, since we treat that online disk area as a cache, that's what we use to help size what would be the, the correct solution for a particular environment. So as we cache these files before moving them down to RDX, the files come in and out of that online disk area. Okay. RDX is actually the best of both worlds. It's got the portability of tape because it's located in a small cartridge, but it's a rugged disc that's contained inside of that cartridge. It's actually a little two and a half inch SATA drive. What's different about this is it's a mobile disc anyway, and a mobile disc drive as it is, and mobile disc drives that used to be powered on and off, and we're familiar with them in laptops. But in addition, what we've done is we've added a lot of shock absorbency inside of this cartridge and some other whistles and bells. One of them is ramp loading and offloading. We actually take that head, that disc armature head, the read-write head, and park it off of the platter completely on a, onto a little ramp. That prevents shock when the cartridge is, is dropped. We can drop these. You would, they'll withstand a meter drop. Um, it prevents the head from bouncing on the platter. Enterprise and desktop systems, the heads will actually park on the inner tracks. So there's a, there's a potential there if you jar a disc too much that you could actually cause that head to pivot or pit the platter. And we prevent that by moving the head completely off of the, uh, off of the platter totally. We provide the scalability because there's no, you can mix and match these. You can go from a 300 gig up to a 1.5 terabyte cartridge. There's no forwards or backwards compatibility issues because these aren't rated together. They're a separate independent drive. It's the software and how we write to them that controls the access of the data or the placement of the data on these drives. The beauty of DISC is instead of a sequential access to retrieve a file from a tape, I now have that random accessibility that I have with disk drives. So we gain a lot of performance because of that. So if we looked at where the Infinivault sits within the environment, over up in the top left, you have a lot of files, unstructured data, could be structured in a, in a content management system or a hierarchical storage management system, an archive application. And that could be something that you already have. Maybe you have an enterprise content management system. We'll have a list coming up in a second of those. But basically, those files are now deposited into a NAS volume. As I mentioned before, that's either SIFS on a Windows server or system, NFS on Linux or Unix. DICOM is mentioned here as well. DICOM is specific to healthcare. That's usually CT scanners, MRI machines, that sort of thing. Um, so that's a separate protocol. By the way, none of this, none of these protocols or anything that are mentioned, including replication, has a separate license. We don't charge you for licenses. The only exception to that would be with DICOM in healthcare. So there's no penalty, if you will, for increasing your capacity. We don't have tiered capacity. So the files are moved or uh, written to these vaults and folders, and we'll go into vaults and folders a little bit. And then from there, the system takes over. So it's all automated at that point. There's nothing left other than setting up the initial vault that needs to be done by the administrator. The files enter the online area. The InfiniVault software then takes the file from there, containerizes it, and brings it down to the near line 
flash offline tier. And I mentioned containerize. What containerize is, is we wait a certain period because this is an archive appliance. So we're looking for a certain size, a certain amount of files, or a certain time limit threshold to be met before we move that data down to the, to the removable, uh, removable tier. There's an audit trail presented on all of this. The metadata is protected. I want to talk a little bit more about the RDX slots and how they're assigned to specific vaults. So when we create a system and configure it for archive, as you see on the slide, we group similar documents or certain similar processes, if you will, with documents together into what we call vaults. And then within these vaults, we create folders. Very simple to do, wizard-driven, very easy and, and uh, simple, as I said, to, to set up. But what happens is each of those vault folders becomes your mount point. So as I said earlier, that becomes the assists a drive letter on a Windows server or a mount point in, in Linux or Unix. And you can see an example up in the upper right, backslash, backslash, infinibol, backslash, email. You could mount the vault to be able to see the folders that are underneath that or mount the specific folder to a, a drive letter or a mount point either way. So some of the ISV applications we talked about earlier, some of those content management or file archive, email archive, are represented here. As you can see in the mix, we've got uh, FileNet and Oracle, as well as the, some of the EMC products, LaserFiche, so forth and so on. We work with all of these products because we have the ability to mount as NAS. So it's a universal access in a sense. It looks like a local disk to the application. You point the application to that and that becomes its capture for uh, depositing files into that repository. A lot of customers spreading the gamut of all of the industries. So I mentioned healthcare, but state and local government, as you can see, um, a lot of these actually on this slide are, are uh, from California, uh, as well as other environments across the U.S. I'm located here in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta Interfaith Broadcasters is a big client of ours, as well as the uh, Veterans Administration. So the Department of Veterans Affairs has been using Incineval for the past couple of years. I'm happy to, uh, to share their stories with you and their successes. Basically, it becomes a tiered archive document management repository that provides you with the compliance and your regulatory requirements that you need to meet. All automated and very, very simple to set up. So if we look at what some of these customers have done, and there's a couple of examples of size here, um, Veterans Affair, they are 30 terabytes of images coming off of their system. So you can imagine taking 30 terabytes from your primary SAN and what that costs you and moving it to a tier that costs one third. That's an immediate gain right there. Not to mention, as I, as I talked about earlier, the ripple effects, the power, the cooling, the reduced backup size. And this is why the archive tier just makes so much sense. And as we implement this more and more in, in different customer environments, they're reaping the benefits of that reduced cost. Content management for email archive, and, and police video archive, SEC regulations and stocks compliance. We all, every industry is faced with some form or version of that, not just state and local government. All the health records for the county, up in Orange County, all of their health records are now kept on Infinibol long-term, infrequently accessed, but when they need it, it's right there. They can immediately get to those records. So if we took an example 
of how we have the data stored currently, that's under the before on a storage array, you have to include the cost of the capacity plus licensing plus support and then what happens downstream, which is the backup. So the application, the servers, all of the hardware and software components that are involved with what's needed for the backup tier. And we have some, some ranges of costs here that we've been able to uh, ascertain through uh, working with our customers and just industry knowledge. And after, what we see is, and, uh, and as I said, it comes out to about one third of the cost of what you're paying. And we're not even including uh, power and cooling uh, and as well as, as uh, data space as well, if that's a concern in that, in that figure. But what we end up with is a common management tier that helps you automate the archive repository across four tiers, as we mentioned earlier, online, near line, offline, and then offsite. So there's some of our clients who have even done away with uh, services that will hold data for them. In other words, they don't have that truck pulling up every Wednesday or Thursday to load in a few tapes so they can take it off site. Um, now they can have a system that automatically produces that or replicate that to another site very efficiently, very easily. Let's look at some of the feedback from our clients going to Infinivault reduced my cost by 80,000, 20,000 a year. That's pretty significant um, in this day and age of doing more with less, and I don't think any of us are <laughs> able to escape that. 30-year lifespan on RDX. At one point in my career, I worked for Plasmon as well, um, so I'm very familiar with what uh, Steve went through there. A lot of mechanical issues with optical um, to replace that in his environment helped a great deal. Now I think, uh, Julie, if you wouldn't mind, we have a, a chance to, to do a little Q&A here. If, if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to discuss um, how we could help further. We do have some questions on this end that I'll cover with you. At this time, we will also take the phones off of mute, so please be conscious of your background noise. But we'd like people that are live on the line today to be able to ask their questions. So if you have a question, please introduce yourself and then ask your question. I will now um, take the phones off of mute, and we can start. I will start with one of the questions that came in via the chat. What if you need to keep records for 75 years, in particular HR records or retirement information? Well, that's a great question. A um, couple of different ways that you can approach that. Um, one is you could set the vault up and folder, subsequent folder where you store the records under the vault, uh, to actually automatically expire those documents, meaning delete those documents, after 75 years. You can actually set uh, as, as many years as you wanted to, or in fact unlimited, so that, that doc, those documents are maintained and their, their authenticity is, is preserved uh, for that amount of time. After 75 years, they would be automatically deleted. Um, and uh, that, that pertains to whether the documents are online in the system, near line with the cartridge inserted, or with the cartridge removed. Once that retention period is hit, the keys that, that, uh, that hold that document are deleted from the system, so it's impossible to retrieve that data off of those cartridges. Wonderful. Um, we have another question. It says, how will the solution work with our current records management policies? That's a great question. So b because it's a it's a NAS system, it simply becomes, as I said, a mount point or a drive letter, depending if you're using a Unix derivative or environment or, or a Windows environment. And what you would do is the path that your document management system now points to to deposit its files now becomes that drive letter. 
you would simply mount the folder under the vault that we talked about earlier on that particular drive letter. And then the files that enter that particular drive letter would then go through the four tiers that we talked about using the Vault Center OS to manage that. So it, all, it would automate everything that you have. Simply changing the path of where you put those files is all that would be needed once you set the Infinite Vault up. Great. Anyone on, is, there, is there anyone on the line that has a question right now? Okay. Well, we do have another question that came in, and you might have covered this. How long does the information remain online before moving to the near line here? Oh, that's, that's a good question. I, I spoke briefly about containerization um, and, and the ability uh, well, I didn't go into too much detail about this, but you have three three modes that you can set the online tier in. One is a balanced mode, so that as data comes in, once we get to once you get to 70% of capacity of your online tier, we'll start stubbing the data, meaning we'll keep the metadata around, but move the 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 weight, if you will, the the, the capacity of those files off to the RDX or nearline platform while maintaining a small stub file. So that if you did a search for the file, it would look like it was still on the system when in actuality part of the file would live on the nearline tier. That could be offline as well, depending on where that cartridge is, if you removed it or not. Now the other modes are you could stub everything as they commit as the files come in immediately, you could stub everything really good for increasing the performance of ingestion. So if you have a lot of files to bring into the system, you could choose to stub them immediately so that you'd keep that online area clean for files coming in or, or available, I should say. And then the other way is you could mark certain files to stay in the online tier. So they wouldn't actually be stubbed and moved off to the RDX tier. They would remain in the online tier as well as be copied to the RDX tier uh, to guarantee their authenticity. That's a good question. Okay, um, we do have another question. What is an average okay. cost savings for moving data off of primary storage to archive? Oh, that's a good question, yes. So what we're seeing, if, if we go across the, the board, on for the clients that have adopted this technology, we're seeing that they're paying about one third of the cost of what they've been paying in primary or, or sometimes secondary stores, depending on how they have things set up. Um, because when you consider the primary or secondary storage, you not only have to consider the capacity or the cost of the drives and hardware, but the software, because a lot of storage systems have capacity-based licensing. And then in addition, um, the backup size, right? So all of the technology you need to provide uh, a platform for the backup of that data. So we're seeing on average about a third of the cost. And as I mentioned earlier, that doesn't include, um, which, are, which are hard costs as well, the, the power and the cooling that's going on as well as, you know, if there's any, any payment for, the, for the, uh, the space that you occupy this equipment in, depending on where you have it. So that's a good question. Great, so if there are no um, live questions, that is all of the questions that were typed into the Q&A box. So I will turn it back to Christina and Jay for your um, closing comments. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to um, say that, uh, thank you all for coming to our webinar. If anyone has any further um, questions or if they've got anything that they'd like to discuss or talk about strategy for, you know, here's what we have and here's where we'd like to be. Um, you know, Jay, Megan, and I are all um, definitely available to chat with you and I believe our contact information will be up there shortly. And um, also, if you're interested in the product, um, you know, we'd be happy to work with you to actually test out an InfiniVault product. Um, again, we've had a lot of success with, with this product in the government space, and, um, you know, we believe that, that it's going to be something that, that you'll be interested in. And so, again, if you have any further questions, um, you know, anything you'd like to discuss with us, 
please feel free to reach out to Megan or me, and we'd be happy to discuss those uh, questions with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. If anything comes up, we, we need to dive a little deeper. Happy to help wherever we can. Um, and I'll, I'll be happy to do a one-on-one -on -one with anyone. Great. Thank you for your time today. You may now exit the event. Have a good afternoon.